All right, electrostatics and electric fields, take two. noticed in ancient times that if you were to rub an amber rod with animal fur, that once you pulled these two things apart, there would be an attractive force between them. This is attributed to Galen. Okay, What the nature of this situation was, uh, wouldn't really be explored in too too much detail till um, you know around the Enlightenment era, and you know there was a couple of uh, ideas. So the first was the one fluid model, and the idea went that inside all substances was some sort of fluid, okay, that could flow out. If it flowed out, you ended up with a deficiency of fluid one system, and that would flow into something else. So in the situation of the amber rod being rubbed by fur, the idea was that the fur was removing fluid from the amber rod and having it flow into uh, the fur. Okay, And then, you know, the attract nature of the attractive force was that this imbalance of fluid um, caused some attraction to, to go on between the two. Okay. Um, then there was the, the second idea, which is the, the two fluid model, which is sort of, you know, more or less what we, uh, we think of today when we when we use electricity analogies. Now we know today, obviously, that um, the electric charge is, is based on two particles, protons and, and electrons. Uh, but in the days of uh, Benjamin Franklin, basically the idea went that side of these things there's pluses there's minuses okay and when we rub an amber rod with fur some of the minuses move from one into the other okay so you end up with more negatives right after you've done this this rubbing back and forth more negatives in one than in the other okay So this would be considered positively charged. This would be considered negatively charged. All right, so, you know, this goes way back. You can do all kinds of neat little experiments to, to look at this. Um, some little examples are you can take a watch glass, put a meter stick on top of the watch glass, and you can charge up another little piece of plastic, like a cheap plastic ruler just by rubbing it with uh, a dissimilar cloth that will impart some charge here and you can actually get this ruler to spin just by holding your charge ruler near it so that's one example another is you can get a stream of water to trickle out of a tap take your, your charged insulator put it nearby you can actually deviate the path of water um, by causing an attraction here so we'll do a couple of these as examples um, but before we do, um, let's just talk about the rules of attraction. And really, it's fairly simple. We probably know from younger grades that like charges repel, and opposite charges attract. Um, and one other thing I'll just mention here is that either charge attracts a neutral. Okay, and when we say neutral, we just mean something that has an equal amount of positive and negative charge in it. Okay, so that's a neutral. And either charged object will attract a neutral. Okay? 
Okay, so um, so you can charge an insulator a contact with a dissimilar insulator. Basically, the concept here, okay, we just did a demo with plastic ruler and some fur. Okay, by rubbing the plastic with fur, we are actually, so in this case, we are pretty sure that the flow of electrons is, is this way. So that means that once we're done, <clears throat> the fur will have lost some of its electrons and the plastic will have gained some of its electrons. Okay, and in the re only in the region where you've charged it do you end up with that excess of charge, right? So if, um, you know, if there was originally three positives and three negatives here and we gained three here, that must mean we've left behind three extra positives over here that we that were always there but um, yeah but now you have this this imbalance of charge so therefore you'll have this this attractive force between them okay so what's the nature of this well there's a couple of things going on the first is that thing to notice here is that positive charge doesn't flow only negative charge can move okay if you think about it inside <clears throat> the substance of the plastic okay you have um, molecules and outside the molecules you have electrons kind of moving around. It's these electrons from the outer shells here that are able to be pulled off. Okay? When you have a region of negative charge here, right? Um, what that will do is it will tend to push this negative charge away, right? In an insulator, however, that negative charge can't move, right? It can't easily flow through the insulator. Um, the nature of the material is such that it does not allow the, the charge to flow around. By contrast, if you were to like suddenly introduce um, an area of negative charge into a metal, well, metals have a different nature. In metals, the outer shell electrons don't bond tightly to their atoms, right? So they can actually flow around. So if you have a big area of negative charge, you're going to have a repulsion. You're going to essentially push negative charge through the metal. If this metal is insulated from ground, if you put it on like a rubber cork or something like that, the extra negative charge will be stuck in it, okay? However, if you connect it to ground, which literally is the earth, either through your finger um, to the ground or through some larger object with a reservoir of electrons, you will find that it will neutralize itself by pushing electrons out to the ground. So if I'm holding a metal ruler in my hand and trying to rub it with fur, Nothing's going to happen because any charge I build up will just flow and ground out immediately. So they have to be insulators to hold charge. No. Okay, so this convention of, of negative and positive comes from Benjamin Franklin. And what he did was he took a glass rod way back in the 1700s and rubbed it with a piece of silk, right? Just like the ancient Greeks had done and noticed an attraction, okay? His convention, and this was just a guess by him, was to call this positive once it had been charged and this negative once it had been charged. Okay? All other substances, negativity and positivity, is measured relative to this convention. Okay? So this is a convention. There's nothing about charge that necessarily, you know, says that it's, you know, positive or negative. There's nothing physical about an electron or a proton. It's just what we call them. It's our name for charge. If you... Yeah, exactly. And if you follow physics, there's there's more of this, right? There's like flavors of quark, right? You can't call them positive and negative. So, I mean, some are a third positive and a third negative and so on. But then some are like up and down and, you know, all sorts of different interesting things. Yeah, so so this comes from this comes from Ben Franklin, 
and really it is the reason why um, charge since that day has been you know um, laid out in this way right now we in you know we're talking about a battery assume that charge flows from positive to negative when in reality that's not quite right it's the electrons that can flow right they're the things that are free to move so technically really we should have a flow of electrons from negative to positive Ben Franklin sort of guessed what was happening here he had like kind of a 50 50 chance unfortunately he guessed backwards so well yeah so if you're you know if you're an electrical engineer or whatever you use classical current right this is called classical current where you have positives flowing to negatives right this is how houses are wired so electricity has been done since the 1700s modern physicists understand though that it's actually electrons that flow so there's also the electron flow um, uh, view, which is more, I guess, physically accurate. But this tends to be what happens in chemistry class. We would often talk about electron flow, where are electrons flowing. It helps you understand things like um, electrochemistry and, you know, how, how batteries work in half cells and so on. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. I have a little handout for you about the history of classical versus uh, electron flow current. It's nothing to get too excited about, but it's kind of an interesting little historical artifact as to why we're still using a convention that is quote-unquote wrong. Okay, so how do we quantify, how do we quantify electricity? We'll say quantifying charge. So the symbol in physics for charge is a big Q or a little Q and is measured in coulombs. Okay, uh, so what is a coulomb? Well, a coulomb is kind of like a liter if you want. It's similar to a liter in that it is an amount of charge. It's an amount of charge or, or even, like a, even like a mole if you want. It's an amount of something. So a coulomb is the amount of charge you would get from uh, 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons or protons. And so by extension, the two charge carriers that we talk about are electrons or protons. That must mean that an electron has a charge equal to 1 over 6.25 times 10 to the 18, uh, which equals 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We call this the elementary charge. And an electron has negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and a proton has positive 1.6 times 10 to the ne negative 19 coulombs. 19, negative 19. It's the charge on 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons or protons. So therefore, each one would have a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And just to finish off, why this number? Where does that come from? Um, coulomb is defined, is defined as the amount of charge a one amp current deposits in one second. So if you have a one amp current flowing through a wire, right, one coulomb passes every second. So the base units for a coulomb then would be the amp, sec amp second. So one amp second is one coulomb.